good morning, Common Good Church, and happy Sunday. My name is Kayla, and I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in and joining with us for our Church at Home worship experience. We are so excited to have you here. If you're new to our community, maybe you're checking us out online for the first time, I just want to extend a special warm welcome to you. We're a Jesus community that believes the church exists ultimately not for ourselves, but for the common good and for the benefit and flourishing of all people and all persons, no matter their race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, education, or even spiritual background. And so we want you to know that whatever your story, whatever your background, wherever you might be on your spiritual journey, we're so glad you're here. We love you and we hope that you're gonna be blessed and encouraged today. In fact, if there's anything we can do to serve you to get you connected and plugged into the life of this community, or maybe you just have a prayer request, would you let us know? Go ahead and jump on our website at commongood.church slash contact and send us a message. We would love to hear from you. Or you can get in touch with us on any of our social media platforms. You can find us at Common Good Church on Facebook and Instagram. Well, in just a moment, we're gonna sing a few songs together. And then after that, you'll hear an encouraging message. Then we'll conclude our time with Holy Communion, so make sure you have your elements of choice on hand if you'd like to participate in that. And for those of you who call Common Good Church your home, just a reminder, you can give online at commongood.church slash give via the Common Good app, or you can text Common Good to 77977. We're so grateful for your continued generosity. Thank you so much for your tithes and offerings that are enabling us to continue to do the work of ministry here in our city and around the world. All right, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to worship. Let's enjoy this time of singing and worshiping together now. I, I've got the joy of the Lord down in my soul. Down in my soul. It feels so good, so good, won't let it go And it feels so good, so good, won't let it go Well, I, yeah, I've got the joy of the Lord down in my down in my soul, down in my soul, down in my soul, and it feels so good, so good, won't let it go. It feels so good, so good, won't let it go. Well, 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 I. I've got the peace of the Lord I can't explain, I can't explain I can't explain, I can't explain And it feels so good, so good Won't let it go It feels so good, so good Well, 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 I, I've got the song of the Lord. I've got to sing, I've got to sing, I've got to sing, I've got to sing. And it feels so good, so good, won't let it go. And it feels so good. So good, so good, won't let it go. Wow, wow. And it feels so good, so good, won't let it go. Hey, 
The voice is calling out of the disappear Broken spirits and dormant dreams How much longer will justice sleep? of saints and sinners too both have walked away from the destitute call them back to sing as one a song of freedom now a song to overcome
Well, hey, what's going on, Common Good Church? Uh, happy Sunday, happy Juneteenth weekend, uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house, all the dads in the house. Uh, it's good to be together and um, hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing well. Hey, a couple things real quick before we jump into the word. Um, hey, next Sunday, love your neighbor Sunday, and uh, we're not gonna be having this gathering. So uh, make sure you go to the website, commongood.church slash neighbor. Uh, this is our time where we get to go out into the community to be the church, to love our neighbor, to work for the common good. And we've got a number of different options available to you uh, as we continue to uh, open up uh, in-person uh, kind of opportunities. Um, you'll see uh, three different in-person options and uh, you can go sign up for that. Make sure you sign up by Wednesday. OK, we just need some time to coordinate the in-person stuff on our end. So uh, if you can, please sign up today. Sign up by Wednesday at the latest. And uh, for those that are not yet ready to do in-person, We've got a virtual option as well. Uh, Pastor Sam has a great, uh, great community partner conversation uh, with Dan Hammer, who is the faith engagement leader at the Lambert House, which is a community center for uh, queer folks, and uh, really kind of talks about what does it look like to, to love our LGBTQ neighbors. So it's a really, really great conversation. If you don't want to do anything in person, make sure you check out that conversation online, okay? Um, so that's next Sunday, Love Your Neighbor Sunday. What else? Hey, uh, we did a restock on our partnership, uh, CG Lifestyle, Common Good Lifestyle, in collaboration with Siren, Caitlin Madriaga, and uh, we sold out on that initial limited release uh, that we did for AAPI Heritage Month. Um, but we actually had some great conversations with ICHS, which is the organization that we're actually raising money for. And uh, they're actually pushing out their fundraiser. So we thought, you know what? Let's sell some more teas. Let's sell some more tote bags. And so we're gonna extend this for a limited time. It's just gonna go to the end of the month. So if you didn't get a chance to get your merch uh, on that first iteration, uh, you, you've got a chance now. We've just restocked. We've got some unisex tees. This is it right here. Um, super, super dope. Uh, make sure you jump online. Go to commongood.life slash siren and you can go get yours today. Okay. Um, last but not least, um, hey, today's a special day. We've got our first in-person summer outdoor worship gathering that's happening simultaneously to this virtual um, talk and so worship space. And so uh, be praying for those that are out worshiping in person. If you're not quite there yet, uh, no worries. We're going to have three of these uh, throughout the summer. So every third Sunday of the summer, June, July, August. And then the hope and the goal is that we're going to be back live in person uh, come September, fully in person uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, but we'll continue to offer a virtual option for those that either because of geographic location, you can't be with us in Bellevue uh, in, uh, on the east side of Seattle, uh, or because of other limitations. And so uh, we're gonna continue to have a, a virtual option as well. Okay, well, hey, with that, um, I wanna continue in a collection of talks that we have now been in for the past several months uh, called Questions. Cultivating curiosity in faith, scripture, and spirituality. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying this sermon series. Y'all have been asking some really, really good questions, questions, some hard questions you've been putting us to work. Uh, but for those that are new to the conversation, um, we are in a season where we're just addressing, exploring, unpacking, and talking about uh, different questions that folks in our community have and are asking and that have submitted to us. And uh, here's the hope. Again, that we might, we might not be able to answer every question uh, directly or every question completely, but uh, as we explore, uh, as to the best that we can, uh, the questions that we are able to get to, uh, our hope is that it'll spark greater curiosity in their lives. Uh, and most importantly, it'll invite us into deeper dialogue in conversation uh, with one another and with God. And so the question before us today, uh, here's what we want to talk about. Here's the question. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Here's the question. How can we have resilience? How can we have resilience? We're going to talk about resilience today. Uh, how can we have the ability, the capacity to, to bounce back, so to speak? Uh, from difficulty, from hardship, from calamity, from trial, from tribulation, from, uh, from adversity? How can we recover uh, in the midst of facing hard, difficult things? I, I love one of the definitions, one of the dictionary definitions of resilience, and it goes as this. The ability of something to return to its original shape after it has been pulled and stretched, pressed, and bent. Come on, has anybody ever been in a season of life where they've felt pulled and stretched and 
pressed and bent. Come on, where, where my father's at? Come on, sometimes the kids do that to us, don't they? Not just literally and physically, but sometimes they do that emotionally and relationally. We feel like we are being at times pulled and stretched and bent in all kinds of ways that our human bodies don't typically go and do, right? And, um, and so this is what this idea of resilience is, right? How can we have this type of resilience where even though we might at times feel pressed, hard pressed and bent and, and stretched that, that we can come back to form, we can bounce back, we can get up, so to speak, back on our two feet after we've been kicked down. Um, how can we have resilience? And I think it's a great question. I think it's a, a relevant question for the times that, that we find ourselves in, right? Because the truth of the matter is, isn't it true? That life can be difficult sometimes. Life can be challenging sometimes. It, and if this past year, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's reminded us of this reality. Right, that difficulty and hardship and challenge and struggle and adversity, they're a part of the human experience. There's, there's no escaping it. And if we do not have the capacity or, or the ability to, to bounce back, to recover, to, to get back up on our two feet, so to speak, we will constantly and perpetually find ourselves feeling and being defeated and discouraged and perhaps sometimes depressed. And maybe some of us, if we're honest, were there this morning. Come on, truth be told, it was hard for us just to wake up this morning. It was hard for us just to, to turn on the TV, to, to watch this, to be a part of this service, right? Because truth be told, some of us, we find ourselves in a season, season where we're feeling defeated and where we're feeling discouraged, right? Maybe for you, it's, it's because you, you, you went to the doctor and you, you got the recent diagnosis. Or, or maybe you've recently lost a loved one. Right, maybe for some of you, you feel defeated and, and discouraged because your finances are in disarray and, and you've, you've lost a job, not just for the first time, but for a second time and a third time. And, and you're just struggling to put food on the table and to, to pay the rent and to pay the mortgage. And, 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 and you don't even know if you're gonna have enough money to, to, to pay the bills next month, right? Maybe for some of us, the, the business is struggling or, or for some of us, maybe we didn't get into the school that we wanted to or we were in that relationship and the relationship didn't work out or the marriage isn't, going where we want it to go or, or the kids aren't behaving the way that they're supposed to behave, right? And so for, for so many of us, perhaps we find ourselves even today in a season, in a situation where we're feeling discouraged, we're feeling defeated, right? Maybe for some of us, right, with, with the ongoing discrimination and, and oppression and marginalization and the violence and the hatred and the bigotry that we experience because of the color of our skin, or because of our, our gender, or because of our age, or our physical or mental ability, or because of our sexual orientation, some of us are feeling discouraged and, and, and defeated. Maybe some of you came to church today, and truth be told, you're feeling discouraged and defeated because of the church, right? Perhaps even this church, hopefully not this church, but the church at large, certainly, right? The, the white evangelical church, come on, in this past year, in the, in the middle of this pandemic, we have seen the underbelly of the church, and we have been reminded of how racist and how sexist and how misogynistic and, and, and how much corruption there is within the church, right? That we have seen the sex scandals and the cover-up and, and the manipulation and, and the gaslighting, and it's caused us to ask the question, do we even want to be a part of the church, what do I even believe anymore? It's caused some of us to begin to wrestle with our faith and the ways in which we have understood and been taught to read and interpret the Bible. And so many of us find ourselves in a, in a season, in a situation where we are deconstructing. And as we deconstruct our faith, we find ourselves at times confused and disillusioned and disoriented. And it can be hard and difficult and challenging. And so we find ourselves in the season we, when we are feeling defeated and discouraged. I, I don't know. I don't know what is causing you today to feel defeated and, and discouraged, but, but can I encourage you? Can I remind you? you? You're not alone. You're not alone. And the fact that you woke up this morning, the fact that you tuned in to church this morning, the fact that you got, maybe you're still in your PJs, but the fact that you showed up, can I suggest, can I encourage you, is an act of resilience. But, but resilience, it's, it's not always easy, is it? Bouncing back, recovering from difficulty and hardship and calamity and adversity, it's not always easy, especially when it keeps happening, right? Especially when you keep getting kicked down. How do you keep bouncing back time and time again? How can we have resilience? That, that's the question before us this morning. Well, to answer that question, I, I want us to, to go to Scripture. 
And uh, if you go to the scriptures, if you open up your Bibles, there's, there's actually a lot of stories about resilience. In fact, one can argue that every single story that we read in the scripture has to do with resilience. Right? When you think about any biblical character, Moses, resilience. Joseph, a story of resilience. Esther, right? Mary, a story of resilience. Jesus, a story of resilience. There's so many places that we could go in this book that reminds us and paints pictures and gives us illustrations of what resilience can look like. But, but the one place in scripture that was speaking to me this week, that was um, getting my attention, was this particular character named Jacob. Y'all remember Jacob? Jacob goes on to become one of the founding forefathers of the nation of Israel. Uh, he had the older, older twin brother, Esau. Remember, the story tells us that Jacob comes grasping after the hill of Esau, and Jacob becomes kind of this conniving, uh, conniving guy who, who tricks Esau into the birthright and tricks his dad, and because of that, uh, Esau is upset. Esau wants to kill him. So next thing you know, Jacob becomes a fugitive on the run and uh, he, he runs away to his uncle Laban's house and there he gets tricked and kind of he, he experienced a little bit, a little taste of his own medicine, right? And he wants to, to marry Rebecca, but then he ends up getting tricked into marrying Leah. And so now he's got two wives and, and, and we get to this portion of the story, the, the particular part of his story, because I think his entire life in many ways is, a, is an act of resilience. But, but there's this one particular part of, of his story that, that got my attention this week. It's found in Genesis chapter 32. If you have your Bibles, uh, go with me there because I want to read it for us. Jacob is now en route to go meet his brother. He, he's got to stop running away. At, at, at some point, he's got to confront the situation. And, and well, Esau has been out to get him, out to kill him, out to destroy him. And so he's like, if this is my demise, it's my demise. And so we find ourselves in this portion of scripture in which Jacob is preparing to go and meet Esau his older brother, whom he tricked for the birthright. And uh, the Bible tells us in, in Genesis chapter 32 that he, he sends his family out ahead of him. And he's going to have an encounter with God, and that's the encounter that I want us to read this morning. It, it's the scene in the story in which Jacob wrestles with God. So let me just read it for us this morning, then I want to just share a couple observations in the remaining time that we have. Genesis chapter 32, uh, verse 22, it says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. That after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Verse 24, so Jacob was left alone. And now while Jacob is left alone now in the middle of the night, it says this, and a man whom we later will discover, this man is, is, is not just an angel, but the man is God, right? A man wrestled with Jacob till daybreak all through the night. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. It was dislocated as he wrestled with the man. Verse 26. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me, unless you bless me. And the man asked, well, what is your name? And Jacob says, well, Jacob. Right, and look at verse 28. The man said, your name will no, will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Watch this. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. I love that. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and you have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Verse 30, so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. I love that story. It's an interesting story, isn't it? Right? The Bible tells us that, that Jacob is, is literally having a, a physical wrestling match with, with God. Come on, how many of y'all have, have, have ever had or can say that you've had a, a, a literal physical wrestling match with God? Right? Not many of us. I'll venture to guess that none of us. We've all wrestled with God in different ways, haven't we? Right? We've had some wrestling matches with God in our heads. We've had some wrestling with God in our spirits, right? We've had some, maybe some wrestling matches with God, with our wills. Come on, anybody ever have a wrestling match with God with your will? God's telling you to go to one place, but you're like, ah, I don't know if I want to go to God. I kind of want to go here, right? 
God says, I want you to go in and love that neighbor. But, but you're like, that, that neighbor? I, 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 right? God says, I want you to go on that mission trip. God says, I want you to start that ministry. God says, I want you to, to but, but, but we're like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could do it. God says, go forgive that person. But we're like, I, I, I can't. Right? We've had some wrestling matches with God with our wills, haven't we? And how many of you, come on, how many have ever had a wrestling match with God with your finances? We do that, don't we? I'm, I'm guilty of this. God says, I want you to tithe. I want you to give. I want you to give extra, right? I want you to give to that person. I want you to give to that organization. You're like, you know what? God, I think I'd rather keep my money in my bank account. I think I'd rather keep that money in the 401k. I think I'd rather keep that money in the stocks. Can I keep that money so I can go buy myself those new pair of Jordans, right? So, yeah, we, we've had some wrestling matches with God, haven't we? But, but, but not many of us can say that we've actually had a literal, physical wrestling match with God. What does, what does the scripture tell us? That, that Jacob is having a literal, physical wrestling match with, with God. And can I suggest, as I was reading and reflecting on this story this week, here, here's what dawned on me. This is a picture, church, of resilience. This is resilience, right? Why? Because think about it, to have a wrestling match with God, but yet to live, to tell the story, to come out on the other side alive, can I suggest as an act of resilience? I mean, think about it. To have a literal, physical wrestling match with God, like God, the God of the universe, the God who breathe life into our very existence, the God who put the stars and the galaxies into motion, the, the God who the Bible tells us owns a cattle of a thousand hills, right? The God who's got the whole world in it, right? To have a wrestling match with that God and to come out on the other side of that match alive? Can I suggest that that's, that's an act of resilience? That, that's an act of, of bouncing back. That's an act of recovering from intense struggle and adversity. Which then begs the question, church, how does Jacob do it? A mere human being who has a literal physical wrestling match with the creator of the universe. How does Jacob have that kind of resilience? Anybody want to know? I don't know about you, but, but I want to know. How can I have that kind of resilience. And so uh, let me make a suggestion. Uh, let me make a few suggestions this morning. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, but what can we learn from Jacob's story? What can we learn from this particular scene in which Jacob has a, has a wrestling match with God, but yet overcomes? And not only does he, he just bounce back up, not only does he get back up on his two feet, but do you realize that Jacob becomes the founding forefather of the nation of Israel? God uses him in an incredible way. How, how, how do you go from wrestling and struggling with God to, to becoming the, the founding forefather of a nation that you and I are here and we are part of his legacy? So let me suggest a, a few things in the next 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes is my goal. I was gonna say five things, five observations in five minutes, five, five observations in, in, in 10 minutes, okay? Here we go. If you're taking notes, write this down. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Uh, let's get practical. Number one is this, how can we be resilient? What can we learn from Jacob? Number one is this, write this down. Resilience requires resistance. Resilience requires resistance. Resilience always requires resistance. Church, if, if you don't know how to be resilient, if you can't resist, you know what it means to resist? Res resistance means to fight back. It means to not give up, to not quit, to not throw in the towel, to, to not tap out. That's what it means to resist. Right? Resilience always requires resistance in the face of opposition and adversity. And the problem is, church, so many of us, too many of us, we have been conditioned to give up in the face of opposition. We have been conditioned in the face of obstacle to say, you know what? That's too hard. I'm going to go this direction. That's what we do. As soon as something becomes difficult and hard, what are we tempted to do? What is our proclivity? It's to, it's to quit. It's to throw in a towel. But, but resilience always requires resistance. In fact, this is exactly what we see Jacob doing. Look at this. The Bible tells us that Jacob and God, they're wrestling through the night. And watch this in verse 25. It says this, when the man, and the, again, the man is God. We know because we've, we've read the full story. We know the end of the story. When the man saw that he could not, listen to this. When God saw that he could not overpower Jacob, 
Consider that. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, other translations say that he could not defeat him. God could not defeat Jacob. He touched, he, gave, he, 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 he cheated. He gave Jacob a little poke in the hip so that his hip was wrenched and, and, and was dislocated. Ch church, here's what we discover. Jacob could not be defeated. Jacob could not be overcome. In other words, here's what we discover. This was not a one-sided wrestling match. Come on, have you ever seen, have you ever witnessed a one-sided wrestling match? Have you ever been in a one-sided wrestling match, right? There's nothing worse than, than being in a one-sided wrestling match where, where you're getting handled, right? All, all, you got nothing. All you do is, is lay flat on the floor and you're like, tap out. I, 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 can't, I can't do that. that that's a one-sided wrestling match. That, that's what my wrestling match is, what my kids look like. My, my boys, especially, they try to wrestle me sometimes, and especially my youngest one, Eli. Right? Eli, tries, he thinks he can get down with his pops, but... But how many y'all know that it's typically a one-sided wrestling match? Because all I got to do is put my 180-pound frame on top of him. And, and next thing you know, Eli's like, Dad, Dad, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Right? That, that's a one-sided wrestling match. Dad, get off me. Now you win. Right? Th that's what a one-sided one wrestling match looks like. But here's what we discovered. This is not at all the wrestling match that Jacob was having with God. No, apparently, Jacob was holding his own. Because God's like, I can't defeat him. I can't overcome him. In other words, what do we discover? Jacob was fighting back. Jacob, come on. He was resisting. He wasn't quitting. He was not giving up. So the only thing God could do was, was cheat a little bit, give, give Jacob a little poke in the hip and dislocate his, his socket. Church, you want to know how to have resilience? It requires fighting back. It requires not giving up. It requires not quitting in the face of opposition and difficulty and adversity. You got to stand your ground. You got to show some resolve if you want to be resilient at the end of the day. You know, yesterday our nation celebrated Juneteenth. And I was thinking about this, right? Juneteenth, the day that, that African Americans were free, well, they were free two years before that with the, the emancipation, but it wasn't until two years later that, that, that everyone was finally free. And even that took some time, but, but nonetheless, that's what Juneteenth is about. It's about freedom, right, for black people. I mean, think about that, think, think about that, right? Now, while we know there, there's, there's much more work to be, be done for the liberation and the freedom of, of, our, of, our, of our black siblings, Come on, think about that. This day was about freedom. But how did Juneteenth happen? It didn't happen because one day white people woke up and were like, you know what? We're racist. We should stop. That's not how it happened, right? It wasn't like one day white people woke up on June 19th and they're like, you know what? Uh, black people are actually equal to us. Right? It's not like they woke up one day and they're like, you know what, let's just, we don't want to make any money anymore. So we don't want to take advantage of other human beings. So let's just let our slaves go free. No, that's not what happened. How does Juneteenth happen? Juneteenth happens because black slaves resisted. Black slaves were refused to give up and to continue to fight for their freedom and their liberation and their equality. And they didn't just fight for themselves. They fought for all of us so that we all could experience greater freedom and liberation. Church, it takes resilience, takes resistance. I mean, the fact that Juneteenth is finally a national holiday, right? For, I mean, for the past 156 years, black people have been celebrating Juneteenth. But it, it, took a, it took a racial uprising. It took protest after protest that swept our nation and swept our globe for our country to finally come to terms with the fact that we need to own up to our ugly past if we're ever going to move forward. Think about it. How does this happen? It's, it's because of resistance. See, resilience always requires resistance. Church, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what, what, what's got you feeling defeated and discouraged. But can I encourage you, if you want to be resilient, if you want to bounce back, if you want to get back up on your two feet, if you want to recover from whatever difficulty and calamity and hardship and struggle and adversity and opposition that you're going through, can I encourage you? Don't quit. Don't give up. Resist. Fight back. Don't give in to the schemes and the plans of the enemy. Fight back and resist. So that's number one. You want to be resilient? Practice resistance. Because resilient, resilience always requires resistance. Number two is this. Write this down. This is a little bit longer. It's, it's, it's a mouthful. Um, listen to this. You want to you know how to be resilient? 
Ask God what you can get out of your struggle before you ask God to get you out of your struggle. Do I need to say that one more time? That's a little confusing. Let me say it one more time. Ask God what you can get out of your struggle before you ask God to get you out of your struggle. Or another way to put it, ask God what you can get from your struggle while you're in your struggle before you ask God to take you out of the struggle. Right? What is our, 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 our tendency? Right? Our, our tendency, our proclivity is as soon as we find ourselves in opposition, not only do we want to give up, but what do we do? We, we start praying to God. We're like, God, get me out of this. God, help me. God, stop the opposition. Stop the pain. Stop the hardship. Get me out of the storm. That's what we do, right? We immediately cry out to God. We're like, God, get me out. But I wonder if the invitation is, not to say that's a bad prayer, but before we pray that prayer, what if we pray a different prayer? God, before you take me out of the storm, what do you want to show me in the storm? What do you want to teach me in the storm? How do you want to transform me in the storm? That, that's, what, that's what Jacob does. Look, look at this in verse 26. The story goes on. The man said, listen to this. God, this is now God speaking to Jacob. Let me go for it is daybreak. They've been wrestling through the night. In other words, right, they've been wrestling all night, but, but look at Jacob's reply. This is what's so fascinating and interesting. God's like, let me go. You let me go, fight's over, done. Let's end the struggle, right? But look at Jacob's reply. I will not let you go until you bless me, unless you bless me. Did you see what Jacob does? God's like, yo, we could be done. I know it's been three, four, five, six hours straight of nonstop wrestling. Can you imagine the struggle? Can you imagine the exhaustion? Right? Can you imagine how tired Jacob must feel to be in a constant battle and struggle for three, four, five, six hours with the God of the universe? He's exhausted, right? The struggle is real. And then on top of that, God dislocates his hip. Now he's in pain. Come on, have you ever had something dislocated? You ever had something in your body that wasn't where it's supposed to be? It's painful, right? Right. Now, now Jacob's not just exhausted, but he's also in pain. Come on in. And how many know that pain isn't fun? Like, I don't know about you, but anytime I experience pain, I want out of pain immediately, whatever you could do. A couple weeks ago, I had to go into the ER because I was having these weird, crazy, like ab abdominal pains, like these cramps that were so intense. I thought I could sleep it off, but it's like 2.30 in the morning. They are not going away. They're only intensifying. I finally wake up my wife. I'm like, Maya, you got to take me to the hospital because I think I'm dying, right? And I'm always dramatic because I can't handle pain like my wife can handle pain. And so she takes me to the ER, but the ER, it's crazy, right? Unless you're dying and, and, and they can tell, I guess, if you're dying or not dying. I think I'm dying, but they're like, no, you, you could you chill, so you can just sit, wait in the lobby for another hour. And then when you finally get your hospital, you, you can wait for the doctor for another hour. So I, it's like four or five in the morning. I'm like, where's the pain meds? Where's the morphine? Like, give it to me because I just need to get rid of this pain. Church, how many know that we do not like pain? Right? As soon as something is painful, we want out of the pain. But what do we discover about Jacob? Jacob's interesting because the struggle is real. He's exhausted. He's been fighting. He's been wrestling with God all night. And not only that, but now he's in excruciating pain. And so God says, hey, this is your way out. You let me go, then I let you go. Struggle is over. But what does Jacob do? Jacob's in pain. He's in the midst of the struggle. And he says, I will not let you go until what? Until you bless me. Until I get your blessing. Church, here's the invitation. What if before we ask God to get us out of our pain and out of the struggle, we ask God, what do you want to show me in the struggle? How do you want to bless me? What do you want to reveal to me before you get me out? God, show me while I'm in it what, what you would have for me while I'm in the pain. Church, you want to know how to have resilience? Do like Jacob. Ask God what you can get out of your struggle before you ask God to get you out of your struggle. Number three, I, I gotta move on. Uh, we gotta finish this up. Number three is this. You wanna know how to, how to have resilience? Number three, listen to this. Stop living in the past and start embracing the new you. Stop living in the past and start embracing the new you. The story goes on in verse 27. The man asks, God asks him, what's your, what's your name? And Jacob says, Jacob, Jacob, that's my name. And then verse 28, look at this. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. But Israel, but Israel, because you have, listen to this, struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. You see what happens? 
Jacob wrestled with God all night, and God does something interesting. God, God changes his name. Now, names are significant in, in, in biblical in, ancient times because names weren't just the name. Like, you don't just pick names out randomly. No, names were about one's identity, right? Names were, that were an embodiment of that person. And, and so he, names were about, right, one's personhood. And so here's what we discover, right, is that God changes his name, but it's not random. It's not by accident. In fact, he names him Israel, which what? Israel in the Hebrew, it's a play off the Hebrew word struggle, so in other words, the name change that God gives is tied to and attached to Jacob's struggle against God and against humans. In other words, here, here's what we discover. Jacob's struggle gives him a new identity. Jacob's struggle gives him a new name. Jacob is a different person because of his wrestling with God. Church, here's what I need us to know. Some of you need to hear this. Adversity will always change you. Difficulty will always change you. Challenge will always change you. Opposition, hardship, calamity, it'll always change you. And the key to being resilient is to stop living into the past and start embracing the new you. See, here's why many of us can never recover. Here's why many of us never bounce back. Here's why many of us continue to live under, uh, under, uh, un under defeat and discouragement and sometimes despair and depression. Is why? Is because we keep trying to live in the past. We keep, we keep trying to go to the, back to the past, right? So when the hardship happens, when, when the, the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or the loss of finances or the loss of, of one's lifestyle, when there's difficulty and hardship, what do we try to do on the other end of it? We look back and we're like, I want to go back to that. I want to go back to the glory days, but here's the thing, you can't go back. Because that back that history, we can't, we can't rewrite, rewrite time. We can't go back in time. And so as long as we try to go back to something that no longer exists, because not only has the time and the situation changed and the season has changed, but you have changed, well then you will constantly feel defeated and discouraged because you're trying to live into something that no longer exists. And so the only way forward is to move forward. The only way to recover and to bounce back is to begin to, instead of trying to live in the past, start to live into the present and start to embrace the new you and start to ask the question, who, who am I now? How am I different? How has this pandemic changed me? Right, I've been thinking a lot about this for the church. Come on, how do we know that this pandemic has changed our church? Right, and so, so here's what we keep talking about. We're not trying to go back to how we used to be 15 months ago. No, we wanna step into our new reality, into our new us into our new identity, God has changed and transformed us. And if we wanna be resilient as a church, if we wanna bounce back as a church and become better and not worse, well, well then we gotta stop trying to go back to how things used to be, the, the good old days. And instead we need to start looking forward. And say, I'm gonna grieve the past, but, but at some point I gotta let go of the past so that I can actually receive my new name, so I could receive my new identity because it's only until we start living into our new identity, into our new name, into the new us, that we will begin to flourish and to thrive. So church, I don't know what it is that you've been going through. I don't know what, whatever hard, difficult thing that you've been experiencing, but can I encourage you? Stop trying to live in the past. Let go of the past. Take some time to grieve the past. But at some point, if you wanna thrive, if you wanna flourish, if you wanna bounce back, you gotta let it go and start living into the new you, all right? Number four is this, I got two more. And did I say five and 10 minutes? Two more, listen to this. You wanna be resilient, you wanna, you wanna know how to be resilient? Recognize God's grace, even in the hard place. Recognize God's grace, even in the hard place. Uh, what, what is grace? Gr grace is, is simply this. Grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favor. Grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favor. And here's the thing about grace, God's grace. Grace is everywhere. God's grace is everywhere. Oftentimes, we only think God's grace is in place as a blessing. We only think that God's grace is available in times we're at the mountaintop. But how many know that God's grace is equally available when we're in the valley low? When we're walking in the shadow of the valley of death, God's grace follows us wherever we go. The question is, do we see it? Do we recognize it? Are we aware of God's grace even in the hard place? And see, when we can recognize God's grace even in the hard place, here's what happens. It produces this thing called gratitude. God's grace when we acknowledge and recognize that, that everything we have and everything that we are is a product of God's unmerited, undeserved favor, then the only outflow is gratitude. 
God, thank you. It's only by your grace. And see, when we can learn to have gratitude, then we can learn how to be resilient. Because when gratitude is on the table, when gratitude fills our hearts, there is no place for defeat. There is no place for discouragement. There is no place for despair. This is what, what happens with Jacob, right? Look at this, verse 29. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. And then listen to this, verse 30. So Jacob called the place. It was a hard place. It was a difficult place. It was a place of struggle. And, and, and it was a place of opposition, right? But Jacob called the place what? Peniel saying, it is because I saw, listen to this, God face to face, and my life was spare. You know what I find interesting? Right, verse 29, if you go back up to what we just read, tells us that God actually blessed Jacob. Jacob gets his blessing, right? But it's interesting, what does, God, what does Jacob call the place at the end of the day? Jacob doesn't call the place the place where God blessed me. What does Jacob call the place? He calls the place Peniel, that says what? It symbolizes the fact that he saw God face to face, but yet he survived. Yet he came out alive. Yet his life was spared. Do you know what Jacob recognizes and understands in that moment? That in that hard place, God's grace was prevalent. God's, play, God's grace was present. God's grace was, was right there. To come out, to wrestle with the God of the universe, but to come out on the other side still alive? A product of God's grace. God's unmerited, undeserved favor. And that produces gratitude. So much so that when Jacob has an opportunity to name the place so that he could remember the place, think about it. What produces greater gratitude? The blessing? Nah. Because if that was what produced gratitude, he would have called this the place of blessing. But he, he says, no, what produces the utmost gratitude is to acknowledge and recognize that it was only by God's grace that I lived to tell the story that I live to tell the story. Church, you want to know how to have resilience? You want to know how to have resilience? You want to know how to bounce back? Learn to see and to recognize God's grace, even in that hard, difficult place. Because when you can learn to do so, just like Jacob, it'll produce gratitude. And gratitude is the key to resilience. Number five is this last one, and I'm done. Write this down. You want to know how to, how to have resilience? Listen to this. Let your pain become part of your purpose. Let your pain become part of your purpose. Or here's another way to say it. You could write this down. I had like five different names for this last point. Let your pain become part of your purpose. Or here's another way to think about it. Let your struggle become part of your story. Let your struggle become part of your story. Or here's another way, if you don't like those two. Let your weakness become part of your witness. If you don't like that one, how about this one? Let your trial become part of your testimony. Come on, let your pain become part of your purpose. Let your struggle become part of your story. Let your weakness become part of your witness. Let your trial become part of your testimony. Look how the story concludes in verse 31. It says, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel. And he was, watch this, Jacob was limping. Limping because of his hip that had been dislocated by God. Therefore, watch this, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Do you realize that Jacob would have a limp for the rest of his life? Jacob would never fully heal. He would never fully recover, at least physically, from his wrestling match with God. Jacob would walk with the limp forever, for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, he would be reminded because of his limp that he struggled with God but he overcame because of God's grace. Here's what I love about how the story ends, is that because of that encounter, and that, that will we discover that, that the, the Israelites to this day, they look back on that moment. And here's what we discover. Jacob's struggle that became part of his story now becomes part of Israel's story. See, the purpose of that wrestling match and Jacob overcoming served a bigger purpose than just Jacob, right? The struggle served a bigger purpose. The pain served a bigger purpose than, than, than just Israel, the person. His new name right, was Israel. No, it served a purpose to remind not just the person Israel, but the nation of Israel and his legacy and his descendants that God is faithful and that God is good and that God's grace abounds even in the most difficult, 
hard situations and circumstances. See, here's what we know. Now, Israelites, from this day forward, continue to remember that even though they find themselves in a difficult place, even though they find themselves in the midst of adversity, in the midst of a storm, in the midst of great intense opposition, they could look back to what Jacob went through. And they could say, because Jacob overcame the struggle. Well, so can we. See, here's what we discover, right? Jacob's pain serves a bigger purpose beyond just himself. And because Jacob was, a, was willing to let his limp, his pain, his struggle become part of his story, well, that becomes his witness. That becomes his testimony. And, and, and Israel will we'll look back and, and be reminded that whatever it is that they're going through, they can be reminded of the fact that Jacob, Jacob's God, who is their God, is always faithful and is always good and is always gracious. Church, you want to know how to have resilience and I'm done. Here's how you want, here's how you can have resilience. Stop trying to hide your limp. Stop, stop trying to cover up the scars. Church, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but, but you've been trying to mask the pain. That's what we do, don't we? Right? We don't want people to know the struggle. We don't want people to know the pain. We don't want people to know about the abuse. We, we don't want people to know about the failure. We don't want people to know about the chronic illness. We, don't, we want to cover it up. Like We don't want people to see because we're embarrassed and we feel ashamed. But church, as long as we continue to cover up our scars, as long as we try to hide the limp, right, we will never fully recover. We will never fully bounce back. It will continue to eat us up on the inside. And not only that, but we rob other people. And we rob the church and we rob the people around us from seeing the goodness and the graciousness and the faithfulness of God that has been lived out through you overcoming your struggle. Church, you want to know how to have resilience? We got to recognize and understand that God could redeem even our pain. This is who God is. Come on, the Bible tells us what the, even what the enemy intended for evil, God will turn it around and use it for good. So here's my question, church, if you want to be resilient, what pain have you been covering up? What scars have, have you been too embarrassed to talk about? What, 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 what's your limp? Because if you want to be resilient, you, you've got to let your, your pain become part of your purpose. You've got to to, to let your struggle and your scars become part of your story. You've got to let your, your weakness become part of your witness. You, you've got to let your trials become part of your testimony. And when you can learn to do that, well then that's when you understand and discover how you can be resilient, just like Jacob was. That whatever life may throw, however difficult the situation, the circumstance, or the obstacle, or the opposition, or the adversity, when you allow that struggle to become part of your story and the pain that you encounter to become part of your purpose. Well, life can throw whatever it may, but, but you recognize and acknowledge that this life is not just about you, that you serve a God who's got a bigger purpose and a bigger plan for what it is that you're going through. And if you allow God to tell that story, then you and I get to become part of the bigger legacy that God is wanting to do in and through your life. You believe that? Would you pray with me, God? We thank you so much. We thank you so much for the story of Jacob. We thank you so much for, 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 for you, God, who is so gracious that, 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 that you would wrestle with the mere human, but in that process that where you could, you could in the snap of your fingers literally obliterate somebody, that you choose to even have these encounters that would change and transform us from the, in, from the inside out. And so God, we thank you for this lesson on resilience today. God, we acknowledge that life can be difficult and hard and challenging and, and this pandemic this past year has, has revealed that to us. But God, we thank you that we worship and we serve a God who, 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 who gives us the tools and the ability and the strength and the grace to allow us to overcome even the greatest opposition. And so, God, I pray for every person here that, that, that is watching, that is listening. But I, I don't know what their struggle, I don't know what their pain, I don't know what the hardship, I don't know what the obstacle, what the opposition is. But, God, I pray that they don't give up. I pray that they resist. 
And God, I pray that as they find themselves in this difficult place, that they will learn to ask you the question, God, what do you wanna show me? What do you wanna teach me? What can I get out of this before we ask you to get us out of it? And God, I pray, God, that you would help us uh, to, to learn to, 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 to put the past behind us so that we can embrace the new us. And so that we would uh, be able to live into the new thing that you are wanting us to do. And God, I pray that, that, that if we're going to be resilient, that you would help us, God. That you would help us to be able to recognize your grace even in the hard place. And most importantly, God, that, that you would enable us and you would empower us and you would help us to understand that our pain serves a purpose beyond ourselves. God, help us to allow our struggle and our scars to become part of our story, for our trial to become part of our testimony, for our weaknesses to become part of our witness, for the glory of you, God. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and all God's people said, amen and amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples, and after giving thanks, he broke bread and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take this and remember me. And after dinner, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this for as often as you drink it and remember me. Church, this is the great work of our Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. And here at Common Good Church, we practice open communion. And what that means is that the table is open for all who call in Jesus' name. So please right now at home, go ahead and partake in communion with your friends and family. I invite you now to uh, join me in a final benediction, and I invite you to open your palms to the Lord to receive a blessing. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, for the cross and for the resurrection, for the life everlasting. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we may go out and be bold in love, be bold in grace, and show people and tell people through our, our actions about your radical love and amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray all of this, amen. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you soon.